well, the deal behind this is I have, um, you know, I have this address that I put up, this P.O. box in Emeryville, and if you want me to take something apart, you can send it in and I'll take a look at it. And we can um, do some kind of tear down and examination on video and do some reverse engineering and see how far that takes us. And if you send me something, I will redact all of your personal info except for just your name on the package and then we'll open it. Let's open this one up. So this comes from Satoshi Labs and I actually have got a letter that goes with this one, but let's, let's open the package first. I can always do this in either order, right? Got a small package in the bigger package. Ooh, got some tamper evident packaging. Oh, lots of stickers. Whoa, a bounty of stickers. That's great. You could construct tamper evident packaging entirely out of stickers. <laughs> oh man, I don't know what I'm gonna do with so many stick out. The actual product, tamper evident and uh, shrink wrapped. You suspect this has been opened by someone else. They want you to send it back so they can diagnose it. Is this like, Oh, great. This is a spare circuit board. This one also looks like it's not been conformal coded. And I mean, the basic idea behind this design is that you you implement this in such a way that all of the secret data is only accessible to the code running on the CPU. It never crosses any external buses. You know, you're doing crypto with keys that are stored in memory on here that's uh, protected at least as best they can with the hardware features available which will mean that you can't run external code on this device and then read the keys back out. That's the programming header unpopulated. That seems right. Well, that's convenient. So we can go ahead and, and start poking around on this one without even having to open the tamper-proof seal if we want. If we want. Yeah, let's take a look at some of the uh, supporting materials we've got. It's a, it's a cryptocurrency wallet. A, a full-size computer is super hard to secure because there's just so much stuff that goes into it. So the idea behind having a little like doodad that you carry around that's in charge of keeping some small piece of information safe is really about reducing the attack surface and making something where you have some chance of actually keeping it reasonably secure. But having an actual display that lets you specifically confirm seems like a great idea. They're linking to this previous uh, power analysis attack. And then, yeah, also Dave did a video uh, where he takes it apart. And I think he tried to reproduce this. So yeah, this, this would be really interesting to dig deeper into, especially this, it looks like a fun read. Yeah, and this is really nice. This is the annotated power waveform. Very simple setup too. It's just a hacked USB cable with a resistor. So you're, you're going to see only pretty low frequency changes in power consumption, but it's enough to, to look at timing differences. I will save the, the juicy bits of this for a video where we can give them the attention they deserve, but thanks so much for sending in that bit of hardware. This will be, be an interesting little puzzle to dig into and see, uh, see what the security of this real world device might actually afford. From Guillaume, and I think this one came from Quebec. So we have some buttons and PCBs by Airmail. Let's see what what this brings us. Whoa! Oh wow! Buttons! Yes, yes, you're right. Yes. Okay, I, I knew these were coming. Um, so Guillaume sent some extra. Amazon buttons to tear down and modify and just generally do fun things with. And yes, that's uh, Mad Beggar in chat. Thanks so much. This is from Amazon EU. It has some stickiness on the back here and I'm like afraid to push it because it might try to phone home and drain its batteries. <laughs> and it's got a little... Because I wouldn't trust this for like a... I don't know why you'd put this on your backpack or something. But if you just want to hang it on a peg on the wall or something maybe only holds it just slightly by the edges. A red X button. <laughs> oh, cool, and here's one that's pre-disassembled. Oh, that's nice, we can get into that right away on the microscope. As promised, here are a few Amazon, da Amazon Dash buttons to play around with. I'm looking forward to bouncing ideas with you. I'm all, I've also added some of the boards that I'd already extracted and from which I've unsoldered the external flash in order to dump its contents. 
<laughs> and a, a homemade breakout board. Uh, lastly, one of my ugliest hell homemade breakout boards with one of those flash chips. Um, the breakout board is a bro broken trace. That's no big deal. Don't worry about that. Uh, the other ones were in a worse condition. Um, and then there's a little GitHub link with some data sheets and notes. Well, that's great. Thanks so much. You can uh, do some hangouts. Oh, yes. And there's a, there's a cheers from Montreal. Um, Guillaume and, and their cats, Einstein, Newton, and Curie. Oh, well, thank you so much. Let's, uh, let's take a look at this on the microscope. Flash breakout board for one of these critters and one of the flash chippies. It's 25Q32. Let's see, that looks like it might have been some desoldered flash. And J2 looks like it's a connector. That's not a microphone, is it? S1789. That can is interesting. It looks like it might be some kind of MEMS or some kind of sensor or something. Oh, there's a big foam contraption. That's the actual switch. That's the actual button part of the button. That's the Wi-Fi controller, I think. Wouldn't expect to see the antenna connector populated. That's interesting. It's under here. Oh, is that all like moisture protection underfill stuff? Weird. Guess they really didn't want mechanical stresses on this chip. And some square test points. Test for manufacturer on power pours and ground pours. It's interesting, smaller components there. I've never actually used these dash buttons at all, so I'd probably want to research like how they're even meant to work. I assume there's some process you'd need to go through to even get them on their on your Wi-Fi by maybe connecting to their Wi-Fi. Like, does this have an access point? I would assume. What is this? Does this have Bluetooth also? If this has Wi-Fi and BLE, that would help with the setup problems. Um, and then you could just use an app to set it up right away. Oh, okay, Madbugger um, clarifies that you can configure via Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or audio. Oh, so that was a microphone. This thing over here, that looked like a microphone. I'm like, why does this have a microphone? But yeah, if they do audio configuration, then sure. That would certainly make the firmware interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, I have to say, it's certainly compelling to follow in your footsteps here and just like take the firmware off of this thing and take a look at it. And that might be a fun thing to do on video. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to play with these devices. We'll have to do something interesting with those on video. Yeah, let me know what you think I should do with the dash buttons, because I'm sure there's plenty of previous research, because it's a pretty popular device. I'm sure other people have hacked on them. Um, personally, I'm kind of curious how all the different pairing mechanisms work. Um, it'd be really interesting to dig into the existing firmware, but it would also be fun just to hack on them and do something more custom. Ooh, this one is heavy. I had to pick this one up at the counter. This one was too big to fit in my P.O. box. All right, so this comes in some interesting packaging already. It's an Apple extended keyboard box. I might actually be careful opening this and not just use a random tool. So this comes from Sam Kelly in California. Oh. Wow, this is actually... Hi, Micah. I was planning on building a custom TMK-based ADB to USB board to put inside this keyboard, so I wouldn't need a separate converter dongle to, uh, dongle thingy in line with its cable. But life work things, ha things happen, it gets put off to the side indefinitely, so I'm sending it your way. The keyboard's fully functional. I had to clean a couple of the switches when I got it, and I believe they all work now. The problem ones were nine and enter. Keyboard nerds are really into these, but I'd rather send it to someone cool than get lowballed by randos on eBay. I hope you like it. Really enjoy the streams. Oh, well, thank you so much. This is really delightful. You know, I used to have an Apple, uh, a Mac LC that I got. I, I didn't, you know, I couldn't, couldn't have afforded one new, but I, I got them. I got this one at a garage sale or something sometime in the late 90s and got like one or two of these keyboards and at least one of them worked. I don't know where those ended up. Maybe my dad still has some of that stuff. But I think I might have given it away to friends at, um, at some point. This is a really beautiful keyboard. And um, gee, maybe there's a way I can tie this into um, the video I'm working on about early USB. This is ADB. This is what Apple used before USB. It's a daisy-chainable serial bus. 
And I, I mean, I vaguely know some things about ADB. Like I'm sure at one point I've seen an ADB timing diagram, but I've never built anything that uses ADB. Oh, what's the difference between ADB and PS2? Um, I mean, they're kind of unrelated protocols. I mean, they're both from about the same era, so they use similar technologies like five volt logic. Now let's take this out of the bag and take a look. Even the cable is pretty clean. That's great. Oh, this is a familiar feel. This is great. And I love the numpad. That's the power button, the old school Apple power button before we had a standard symbol. <laughs> look at the font on those. <laughs> yeah, it's a little stiff, but it still works. M3501. It'd be interesting to do some kind of internal modification like Sam was planning on doing. And I'm also just kind of curious whether there's any reason to reprogram the firmware on the existing microcontroller, if that's even doable. Oh, that's cool. Um, threaded insert there. I think it's as simple as just um, putting a spudger around the edge and snapping these bits. But... Ah, I think that did it. Mm -hmm. Vintage dust bunnies, even. That's cool. Is that gonna be a ROM processor right there? ADC49, AP6. So maybe an Apple customized mask ROM processor. Single component microcomputer. This is cool. I've not come across any MCS48 chips before. 2K of Ascrom, 4K of external, 128 bytes of RAM. Oh, and this is the same chip the original IBM keyboard used. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of curious to look at the microcontroller firmware, but I don't know how many layers of inconvenience that would involve. Like, does this chip have code readout at all? Could you read it out? Would you have to make a special tool for that? Um, how common are disassemblers for this architecture? What was that other chip? So they've got a 7404, which is just an inverter. And then this other big chip is an MC14515, which I think was some kind of decoder. Oh, it's a latch. Oh, and a four to 16 decoder. So this would just be some, like they're using this to help scan the entire keyboard matrix because the main chip probably doesn't have quite enough IO. Well, yeah, I mean, it might be interesting to tinker with, but there isn't much practical reason to replace that unless you wanted to try to make this into a low power wireless keyboard. And I don't know, wireless keyboards are okay, but I'm not the hugest fan of wireless keyboards. And this thing is heavy enough that, I don't know if you'd need that anyway. I don't know what this component is. It looks like a relay, but... Oh, it says L1, so that could just be a filter inductor. James says there's a dedicated power button pin. Yeah, for USB they had to invent some low-level signaling for power wake up, um, but it's not quite as simple as just having a separate pin for power. <laughs> power switch, five volts, ground, and data. 125 kilobits. Oh, they had an ASIC. How many web pages do I have to visit before someone shows me a timing diagram? Wasn't expecting this to come from microchip. 1994. This is much more useful. Look at this, like documentation written by and for electrical engineers. So it's normally high. There's a header. There's a sink. There's a byte. Cool. There's the bit cell format. So it's a little bit more like one wire than async serial. But like you can imagine how this could be implemented using just a handful of like shift registers and capacitors and gates. I wonder what it was like to try to implement an ADB peripheral back in the day. Like, did Apple have a nice specification for it? Nice little separate boards to mount the ADB so you don't cause stress on the main board. It's cool. And then that's the slidey mechanism up there, looking a bit rusty. Ah, the keys feel so nice. 
Well, thanks so much for the donation. I will uh, try to turn this into something interesting and share as much of the process as I can. It's so nice they used a threaded insert there. It means that you can just take this apart as much as you want without really worrying about damaging it. 